Bosham Sharp Tragedy From Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia at en.wikipedia.org The Bosham Sharp Tragedy, sometimes called the Kentucky Tragedy, refers to the murder of Kentucky legislator Solomon P. Sharp by Jeroboam O. Bosham. As a young lawyer, Bosham had been an admirer of Sharp's until the latter allegedly fathered an illegitimate child with a woman named Anna Cook. Sharp denied paternity of the stillborn child. Later, Bosham began a relationship with Cook, who agreed to marry him on the condition that he kill Sharp. Bosham and Cook married in June 1824, and in the early morning of November 7, 1825, Beauchamp murdered Sharp at Sharp's home in Frankfort, Kentucky. An investigation soon revealed Beauchamp as the murderer, and he was apprehended at his home in Glasgow, Kentucky, four days after the murder. He was tried, convicted, and sentenced to death by hanging. He was granted a stay of execution to allow him to pen a justification for his actions. Anne Cook Beauchamp, was tried for complicity in the murder, but was acquitted for lack of evidence. Nevertheless, her devotion to Bosham prompted her to stay in his cell with him, where the two attempted a double suicide by drinking laudanum shortly before the execution. This attempt failed. On the morning of the execution, the couple again attempted suicide, this time by stabbing themselves with a knife Anna had smuggled into the cell. When the guards discovered the attempt, Beauchamp was rushed to the gallows, where he was hanged before he could die of his stab wound. He was the first person legally executed in the state of Kentucky. Anna Cook Beauchamp died from her wounds shortly before her husband was hanged. Per their wishes, the couple's bodies were positioned in an embrace and buried in the same coffin. While the primary motive for Sharp's murder was defending the honor of Anna Cook, Speculation raged that Sharp's political opponents instigated the crime. Sharp was a leader of the New Court Party during the Old Court-New Court controversy in Kentucky. At least one Old Court partisan alleged that Sharp denied paternity of Cook's son by claiming the child was a mulatto, son of a family slave. Whether Sharp actually made such a claim has never been verified. New court partisans insisted that the allegation was concocted to stir Beauchamp's anger and provoke him to murder. The Beauchamp-Sharp tragedy served as the inspiration for literary works, most notably Edgar Allan Poe's Unfinished, Politician, and Robert Penn Warren's World Enough and Time. Section 1. Background Jeroboam Beauchamp was born in Barron County, Kentucky, in 1802. Educated in the school of Dr. Benjamin Thurston, he resolved to study law at age 18. While observing the lawyers practicing in Glasgow and Bowling Green, Beauchamp was particularly impressed with the abilities of Solomon P. Sharp. Sharp had twice been elected to the state legislature and had served two terms in the U.S. House of Representatives. Beauchamp became disenchanted with Sharp when, in 1820, a woman named Anna Cook claimed Sharp was the father of her stillborn infant. Sharp denied paternity of the child. Public opinion favored Sharp, and a disgraced Cook became a recluse at her mother's estate in Bowling Green. Beauchamp's father lived only a mile, 1.6 kilometers, from Cook's estate, and Jeroboam began to seek audience with her. Beauchamp gradually gained Cook's trust by visiting under the guise of borrowing books from her library. By summer 1821, the two became friends and began a courtship. Beauchamp was 18, Cook was at least 34. As the courtship progressed, Cook told Beauchamp that, before they could be married, Beauchamp would have to kill Solomon Sharp. Beauchamp agreed to this request, expressing his own desire to dispatch Sharp. The preferred method of honor killing in that day was a duel. Despite Cook's admonition, that Sharp would not accept a challenge to duel, Beauchamp traveled to Frankfurt to gain an audience with Sharp, who had recently been named the state's attorney general by Governor John Adair. Beauchamp's account of the interview states that he bullied and humiliated Sharp, that Sharp begged for his life, and that Beauchamp promised to horsewhip Sharp every day until he consented to the duel. 
For two days, Beauchamp remained in Frankfurt, awaiting the duel. He then discovered that Sharp had left town, allegedly destined for Bowling Green. Beauchamp wrote to Bowling Green, only to find that Sharp was not there and was not expected. Thus, apparent disinformation saved Sharp from Beauchamp's first attempt on his life. Cook then resolved to kill Sharp herself. The next time Sharp was in Bowling Green on business, she sent a letter to him that denounced Beauchamp's actions in Frankfurt and claiming she had broken off all contact with him. She requested that Sharp visit her at her estate before he left town. Sharp questioned the messenger who delivered the letter and suspected a trap. Nonetheless, he sent a response that he would visit at the time appointed. Beauchamp and Cook awaited the visit, but Sharp did not come. Beauchamp rode to Bowling Green to investigate and found that Sharp had left for Frankfurt two days earlier, leaving substantial unfinished business. The plot had been foiled again, but Beauchamp concluded that Sharp would eventually have to return to Bowling Green and finish the business he had left. Determined to await Sharp's return to the city, Beauchamp opened a legal practice there. Throughout 1822 and 1823, Beauchamp practiced law and waited for Sharp to return. He never did. Despite Beauchamp's inability to kill Sharp, Cook married Beauchamp in mid-June 1824. Beauchamp immediately hatched another plot to kill Sharp. He began sending letters, each from a different post office and signed with a pseudonym, requesting Sharp's assistance in settling a land claim and asking whether he would again be in Green River country. Sharp finally answered Beauchamp's last letter, mailed in June 1825, but gave no date for his arrival. Section 2. Murder Serving as Attorney General in Governor Adair's administration, Sharp had become involved in the Old Court-New Court controversy. The conflict was primarily between debtors who sought relief from their financial burdens after the Panic of 1819, the New Court, or Relief, faction, and the creditors to which these obligations were owed, the Old Court, or Anti-Relief, faction. Sharp, who had come from humble beginnings, sided with the New Court. By 1825, the New Court faction's power was on the decline, and in an attempt to bolster the party's influence, Sharp resigned as Attorney General in 1825 to run for a seat in the Kentucky House of Representatives. His opponent was old court stalwart John J. Crittenden. During the campaign, old court supporters again raised the issue of Sharp's seduction and abandonment of Anna Cook. Old court supporter John Upshot Waring printed handbills that not only accused Sharp of fathering Cook's child, but further claiming that Sharp had denied paternity of the child on the grounds that it was a mulatto and the son of a Cook family slave. Whether Sharp actually made such a claim has never been determined with certainty. Despite the allegations, Sharp won the election. Word of Sharp's alleged claims soon reached Jeroboam Beauchamp, reigniting his hatred of Sharp and strengthening his resolve to kill him. Beauchamp now abandoned the idea of killing Sharp honorably in a duel. Instead, he decided to assassinate Sharp, casting suspicion on his political enemies. To add to the political intrigue, Beauchamp plotted to commit the murder on the eve of the General Assembly's opening session. Beauchamp came to Frankfurt on business on November 6th. Unable to find lodging at the local inns, he rented a room in the private residence of Joel Scott, warden of the state penitentiary. Some time after midnight, Scott heard a commotion from Beauchamp's room and, upon investigating, found the door latch open and the room abandoned. Beauchamp, clad in a disguise, buried a set of his clothes near the Kentucky River, then proceeded to Sharp's house. Sharp was not at home, but Beauchamp soon found him at a local hotel. He returned to Sharp's house, concealed himself nearby, and waited for Sharp to return. He observed Sharp re-enter the house about midnight. Beauchamp approached the house at approximately 2 o'clock in the morning on November 7, 1825. In his confession, he described the encounter. I put on my mask drew my dagger, and proceeded to the door. I knocked three times loud and quick. Colonel Sharp said, Who's there? Covington, I replied. 
Quickly, Sharp's foot was heard upon the floor. I saw under the door as he approached without a light. I drew my mask over my face, and immediately Colonel Sharp opened the door. I advanced into the room, and with my left hand, I grasped his right wrist. The violence of the grasp made him spring back, and trying to disengage his wrist, he said, What Covington is this? I replied, John A. Covington. I do not know you, said Colonel Sharp. I know John W. Covington. Mrs. Sharp appeared at the partition door and then disappeared. Seeing her disappear, I said in a persuasive tone of voice, Come to the light, Colonel, and you will know me. And pulling him by the arm, he came readily to the door, and still holding his wrist with my left hand, I stripped my hat and handkerchief from over my forehead and looked into Sharp's face. He knew me the more readily I imagined, by my long, bush, curly suit of hair. He sprang back and exclaimed, in a tone of horror and despair, Great God, it is him! And as he said that, he fell on his knees. I let go of his wrist and grasped him by the throat, dashing him against the facing of the door, and muttered in his face, Die, you villain! As I said that, I plunged the dagger into his heart. From Jeroboam Bosham, Confession of Jeroboam O. Bosham. The wound severed Sharp's aorta, killing him almost instantly. Sharp's wife, Eliza, witnessed the entire scene from the top of the stairs in the house, but Bosham fled before he could be identified or captured. Returning to the location where he had buried his regular attire, he changed clothes, tied the accoutrements of his disguise to a rock, and sank them in the Kentucky River. He then returned to his room at the house of Joel Scott, where he remained until the following morning. Section 3. Arrest The Kentucky General Assembly authorized the governor to offer a reward of $3,000 for the arrest and conviction of Sharp's killer. The trustees of the city of Frankfurt added a reward of $1,000 and friends of Sharp raised an additional $2,000 reward. Suspicion for the killing rested on three men, Beauchamp, Waring, and Patrick H. Darby. During Sharp's 1824 campaign for a seat in the Kentucky House of Representatives, Darby had remarked that, should Sharp be elected, quote, he would never take his seat and would be as good as a dead man. Waring had made similar threats, boasting that he had already stabbed six men. A warrant was sworn out for Waring's arrest, but it was soon discovered that he was incapacitated after being shot through both hips the day before Sharp's death. When Darby discovered that he was under suspicion, he began his own investigation into the murder. He traveled to Simpson County, where he met Captain John F. Lowe who told Darby that Beauchamp had related to him detailed plans for the assassination. He also furnished Darby with a letter that contained damaging admissions against Beauchamp. The first night following the murder, Beauchamp stayed at the home of a relative in Bloomfield, Kentucky. The next day, he traveled to Bardstown, where he spent the night. He lodged with his brother-in-law in Bowling Green on the night of November 9th, before returning to his home in Glasgow. On November 10th. He and Anna had planned to flee to Missouri, but before nightfall a posse had arrived from Frankfurt to arrest him. He was brought to Frankfurt and tried before an examining court, but Commonwealth's attorney, Charles S. Bibb, confessed that he had not yet collected enough evidence to detain him. Beauchamp was released, but agreed to stay in Frankfurt for ten days to allow the court to finish its investigation. During this time, Beauchamp wrote letters to John J. Crittenden and George M. Bibb requesting their legal aid in the matter. Neither letter was answered. Meanwhile, Beauchamp's uncle, a state senator, composed a defense team that included former U.S. Senator John Pope. During the investigation, unsuccessful attempts were made to match a knife taken from Beauchamp upon his arrest to the type of wound observed on Sharp's body. Efforts to match a footprint found near Sharp's house to Beauchamp were similarly unsuccessful. The posse that arrested Beauchamp had taken a bloody handkerchief from the crime scene, but had lost it on the trip back to Frankfurt after the arrest. 
the best evidence presented by the prosecution was the testimony of sharp's wife eliza that she heard the killer's voice and that it was distinctly high-pitched when given the opportunity to hear beauchamp's voice she identified it as that of the killer when questioned patrick darby testified that in eighteen twenty four beauchamp had solicited his service in order to bring suit against sharp for unspecified charges during the ensuing conversations between himself and beauchamp the latter related the story of sharp's abandonment of anna cook swearing that he would kill him one day even if he had to come to frankfort and shoot him down in the street the combined testimonies of eliza sharp and patrick darby were sufficient to persuade the city magistrates to hold beauchamp for a trial during the circuit court's next term which began in march eighteen twenty six section four trial beauchamp was indicted and his trial began may eighth eighteen twenty six beauchamp pleaded not guilty but never testified during the trial captain lowe was called to repeat the story he had originally related to patrick darby regarding beauchamp's threats to kill sharp he further testified that beauchamp returned home following the murder waving a red flag and declaring that he had quote, gained the victory he also turned over to the court a letter from the beauchamps regarding the murder in the letter beauchamp maintained his innocence but told lowe that his enemies were plotting against him and asked him to testify in his behalf the letter gave lowe several talking points to mention if called to testify some true and some other ones eliza sharp repeated her assertion that the murderer's voice was that of beauchamp joel scott the warden who gave beauchamp lodging the night of the murder testified that he heard beauchamp leave during the night and return later that night he also mentioned that Beauchamp was extremely inquisitive about the crime upon being told of it the next morning. The most extensive testimony came from Darby, who recounted his 1824 meeting with Beauchamp. According to Darby, Beauchamp claimed that Sharp had offered he and Anna $1,000, a slave girl, and 200 acres .81 square kilometers, of land if they would leave him alone. Sharp later reneged on the offer. Some witnesses maintained that the killer's claim to be John A. Covington was telling. They said that both Sharp and Beauchamp had been acquainted with John W. Covington, but that Beauchamp often mistakenly called him John A. Covington. Other witnesses told of threats they had heard Beauchamp make against Sharp. Beauchamp's defense team attempted to discredit Patrick Darby by stressing his association with the old court and playing up the theory that the killing was politically motivated. They also presented witnesses who testified that they knew of no hostility between Beauchamp and Sharp and questioned whether Darby and Beauchamp's 1824 meeting ever occurred. During closing arguments, defense counselor John Pope attempted to discredit Darby, a tactic that provoked Darby to assault one of Pope's co-counselors with a cane. The trial lasted thirteen days, and despite the absence of any physical evidence, including a murder weapon, the jury returned a guilty verdict after only an hour of deliberation on May 19th. Beauchamp was sentenced to be executed by hanging on June 16, 1826. During the trial, Anna Beauchamp appealed to John Waring for help on her husband's behalf. She also tried to entice John Lowe to commit perjury and testify on her husband's behalf. Both appeals were denied. On May 20th, Anna was examined by two justices of the peace on suspicion of being an accessory to the murder, but was acquitted due to lack of evidence. The jailer permitted Anna to stay in the cell with Beauchamp at her own request. Pope's request to have the verdict overturned was denied, but the judge granted Beauchamp a stay of execution until July 7th to allow him to produce a written justification of his actions. In it, he explained how he killed Sharp to defend Anna's honor. Beauchamp had hoped to publish his work before his execution, but the libelous charges it contained, that prosecution witnesses committed perjury and bribery to see him convicted, delayed its publication. Section 5. Execution The Beauchamps were accused of trying to bribe a guard to let them escape, but this attempt failed. They also attempted to get a letter to Senator Beauchamp requesting his help in escaping. 
A final plea for another stay of execution from Governor Desha was denied on July 5th. Later that day, the couple attempted a double suicide by taking large doses of laudanum, but both were unsuccessful. On July 7th, the morning of Beauchamp's scheduled execution, Anna requested that the guard allow her privacy while she dressed. Anna again attempted to overdose on laudanum, but was unable to keep it down. Anna then produced a knife that she had smuggled into the cell, and the couple attempted another double suicide by stabbing themselves with it. When they were discovered, Anna was taken to the jailer's home and tended to by doctors. Weakened by his own wounds, Beauchamp was loaded on a cart to be taken to the gallows and hanged before he bled to death. He insisted on seeing his wife before being executed, but doctors told him she was not severely injured and would recover. Beauchamp protested that not being allowed to see his wife was cruel, and the guards consented to take him to her. Upon arriving, he was angered to see that the doctors had lied to him, and it was too weak even to speak to him. He remained with her until he could no longer feel her pulse. Then he kissed her lifeless lips and declared, quote, For you I lived, for you I died. On his way to the gallows, Beauchamp asked to see Patrick Darby, who was among the assembled spectators. Beauchamp smiled and offered his hand, but Darby declined the gesture. Beauchamp then publicly denied that Darby had any involvement with the murder, but accused Darby of having lied about the 1824 meeting where Darby testified that Beauchamp told him of his plan to kill Sharp. Darby denied this accusation of perjury and tried to engage Beauchamp in a discussion about it, hoping he would retract the charge, but Beauchamp immediately ordered the cart driver to continue to the gallows. Upon arriving at the gallows, Beauchamp assured the assembled clergy that he had a salvation experience on July 6th. Too weak to stand, he was held upright by two men while the noose was tied around his neck. At Beauchamp's request, the 22nd Regiment musicians played Bonaparte's retreat from Moscow, while 5,000 spectators watched his execution. It was the first legal hanging in Kentucky's history. Beauchamp's father requested the bodies of his son and daughter-in-law for burial. The two bodies were put in a single coffin, locked in an embrace, as they had requested. They were buried in Maple Grove Cemetery in Bloomfield, Kentucky. The couple's tombstone was engraved with a poem written by Anna Beauchamp. Section 6. Aftermath Beauchamp's confession was published in 1826, the same year as The Letters of Anne Cook, the authorship of which is disputed, and a transcript of Beauchamp's trial authored by J. G. Dana and R. S. Thomas. The following year, Sharp's brother, Dr. Leander Sharp, penned Vindication of the Character of the Late Colonel Solomon P. Sharp to defend Sharp from the charges made in Beauchamp's confession. Patrick Darby threatened to sue Dr. Sharp if the work were published, John Waring went a step further, threatening Dr. Sharp's life if he published Vindication. All copies of the work were left in the Sharp's home in Frankfurt, where they were discovered many years later during a remodel. Though many regarded Sharp's murder as an honor killing, some new court partisans charged that Beauchamp had been incited to violence by members of the old court party, specifically Patrick Darby. Sharp was thought to be the minority party's choice for Speaker of the House for the 1826 session. By enticing Beauchamp to murder Sharp, the old court could remove a political enemy. Sharp's widow Eliza apparently subscribed to this notion. In an 1826 letter in the New Court Argus of Western America, she referred to Darby as, quote, the chief instigator of the foul murder which has deprived me of all my heart held most dear on earth. Some old court partisans claimed that Governor Desha had offered Beauchamp a pardon if he would implicate Darby and Achilles Sneed, clerk of the old court, in his confession. Shortly before his execution, Beauchamp was heard to say he had, quote, been new court long enough and would die an old court man. Beauchamp had steadfastly identified with the old court, and his claim seems to imply that he had at least considered colluding with the new court powers to secure his pardon. Such a deal is explicitly mentioned in one version of Beauchamp's confession. 
but Sham ultimately rejected the deal for fear that he would be double-crossed by the new court, leaving him imprisoned and deprived of the, quote, chivalrous motive for his actions. Darby himself denied involvement with the murder, claiming that new court partisans such as Francis P. Blair and Amos Kendall were seeking to defame him. He also countered that Eliza Sharp's letter to the New Court Argus was written by New Court supporters, including Kendall, the newspaper's editor. The claims and counterclaims between the two sides reached such an extreme that an 1826 letter in the New Court Argus suggested that New Court supporters had instigated Sharp's murder in order to blame Old Court partisans and affix a stigma to them. Darby eventually brought suit for libel against Kendall and Eliza Sharp, as well as Senator Beauchamp and Sharp's brother Leander. Numerous delays and changes of venue prevented any of the suits from ever going to trial. Darby died in December 1829. Section 7. In Fiction The Beauchamp-Sharp tragedy inspired fictional works notably Edgar Allan Poe's unfinished play Politician, and Robert Penn Warren's World Enough and Time. William Gilmore Sims wrote three works based on the Sharps' murder and aftermath, Beauchampé, or The Kentucky Tragedy, A Tale of Passion, Charlemont, and Beauchampé, a sequel to Charlemonte. Gray's Lair, a romance of the Mohawk, by Charles Fenno Hoffman, Octavia Bragaldi by Charlotte Barnes, Sybil by John Savage, and Conrad Enudora, or The Death of Alonzo, a Tragedy, and Leona, the Orphan of Venice, both by Thomas Hawley Shivers, all draw to some degree on the events that surround Sharp's murder. This sound file and all text in the article are licensed under the GNU Free Documentation License available at www.gnu.org forward slash copy left forward slash fdl dot html.